the next piece or strand in the beginning of the 20th century is socialist realism. In a way, we should talk first about what I'm going to call soon cosmopolitan shared European modernism because in some ways it sort of runs alongside and precedes this other movement we're going to talk about now but I'm gonna just go ahead and talk about it now. Socialist realism. The first world war is where we're going to start right around that time because in Russia, the beginning of the 20th century, the nation and the region had undergone intense and rapid changes. The First World War, 1914 to 1918, was the war to end all wars. It pitted great imperial powers against each other, and it was fought from behind the lines by strategists moving, as it were, pawns on the battlefield. If you want a really poignant picture of such uh, the way in which this war was fought, the, the unforeseen devastation that it will have, and we'll look at it again in another video on specifically on war, um, I really recommend to you Rowan Atkinson's series Black Adder. Uh, if you find the installment uh, this, the, of the series that takes place during World War I, the final episode has Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry and Rowan Atkinson all as soldiers in this kind of battlefield. Some of them are in the trenches, Stephen Fry plays the general behind the lines, and he just basically says, well, yes, go off and get killed, Hugh Laurie. And, and they, they show the poignancy of this, this great devastation that, that hadn't been experienced to this degree in the modern world ever. And this idea that the people behind the lines were, were not the ones in danger at all. They are sending people into battle. This has a, 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 um, a, a rippling and profound effect on, on the world of, of this time. As with the, the world, uh, Think about how the world's lines, the European map, is redrawn after the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. Remember, we talked about this at the beginning of the semester, Congress of Vienna, Metternich. Country lines are redrawn. So too does this happen, this great upheaval, distinct shifts in imperial powers. Indeed, the war did not World War I did not mark the end of imperial governments, but the economic and political instability of that time period prepared the ground for the rise of at least three totalitarian states. The Soviet Union under Stalin, fascist Italy under Mussolini, and Nazi Germany under Hitler. All three of these players are then going to be involved in the arena in the Second World War, but the ground is laid for these conflicts with the rise of these three imperialist powers. Their creation was based in part on an image of new modern government. Remember Zukunft music? Music of the future. Think Zukunft government. Government of the future. This idea of a huge government with incredible resources and momentum to not just sort of rule, but to convince masses of people to their ways of thinking. It's not just I'm gonna tax you and you're gonna I'm gonna and you're gonna be my person because I rule you. It's you're going to think the way I want you to think. You're going to have ideals. And, and you're gonna live the way I want you to live. It's, it's a, a social revolution as much as it is a political change. In the US, the reaction to this totalitarianism created social and political ripples that we are still dealing with today. I think here specifically of the push against socialism for unified healthcare. The, the word socialism in the United States has, since the 1950s at least, been a really dirty word. Oh, socialist. Likewise, in our recent times, the word fascist 
has is is a turning point. Ah, oh, fascism. Right. The um, the degree to which we react instinctively in the United States as Americans to these words collectively goes back to the beginning of the 20th century when these big powers are arising. Let's turn right now, as I said we would, to Russia and the Soviet Union, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, which is Russia and the countries that it annexed and joined together into smaller, into states that are now part of this massive um, country. So World War I, uh, 1914 to 1919, I don't know why I said 17 earlier, in 1917, the Bolshevik Party, under Lenin, took power and established what would become a Republic of Regions, thus the USSR, which collapsed, by the way, in 1991 and became again Russia and several independent semi-autonomous or autonomous countries. Soviet communism, again, a word that Americans have grown up learning to to, to fear. Soviet communism was atten intended, at least in theory, to be the practical working out of Karl Marx's ideas, which rejected capitalism as a, as a useless endpoint of economic strategy, and instead this communist ideal would suggest that government from the people from the lowly workers, government from the bottom up, that was the way to run things. The idea was that the emancipation from uh, an inherited class system and from a class system based on unequal wealth, that this, this would be the way to go. The emancipation of inheritance as a class society We've seen ripples of this in history in this course before. Fraternité, égalité, liberté. People, based on their equality, rather than, hey, I'm the son of the Duke, therefore I get to have all the privileges. Hmm. This is another version of it. Karl Marx comes up with these ideas in the 19th century. This is meant to put it in practice. Whether that happens in actual practice or not, it does not happen that way in, in actual practice, at least for very long. The USSR transformed this political theory, especially under Stalin in the 1920s. Every aspect of society was subjected to revision, not just laws or taxes, but how you work, what you wear, what you say, what music do you sing with your friends at the pub at night? What music do we hear in concerts? What paintings do people write? What literature may you read? What literature may you write? All of these things were under revision and they gradually uh, acquired, really under totalitarianism, con extreme control. The, the government began to control every aspect of life so that there was, the, I think the original idea is that there's no preferential treatment that you say, oh, you can write that, but you can't write that because you're the son of a duke, but you're just a baker. Now, everyone must follow the same exact rules so that nobody is placed higher above another. However, it, it clearly in looking back in history has become a tool to consolidate power in the hands of a few. That's what totalitarianism essentially is, is that the, there are a few people that control the fate of many. So, in fact, as I say, the, so the USSR initially sought to be seen as a modern contemporary equal, leaping centuries ahead of the old czarist Russia. Oh, that imperial Russia was so old-fashioned. They wanted to be seen as the, the, the country of the future. They were going to show all the other European nations that were still monarchies that this was the better new way to live. Does this sound like Zukunft music? It should. The music of the future. Throw away the old things and let's forge ahead and we'll show you. We're going to clear the ground 
and we're going to create everything new. In 1929, however, Stalin initiated a second internal revolution in the USSR to exercise absolute control. The trappings of governed by the people, for the people, at the level of the people became quickly shifted to it is in the control of the right party. The people, I don't mean right, right, left, politically, I mean the correct party. The people who should have the control have the control. This is a whole course worth of history and it's, it's worth pondering, especially in modern times. But let me take it more at home for us musicians. The arts were seen by the government as a fantastic tool for education and propaganda. A way to promote the Soviet ideal. Incidentally, the centuries-old Russian Orthodox Christianity, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and Russian Jews were, of course, discouraged, along with their music, under this regime. You don't want, if you are trying to show the people of your country that you, the government, and the head of the government, are the sole source of everything, you don't want Christianity to mess that up, because Christianity says there is a another higher power, a bishop who is answerable perhaps to an archbishop who's eventually you get up to God who's not answerable to your government. The same thing in the Jewish faith. You are talking about, you say, well, I'm going to be your be all and end all as your ruler. And, and you say, well, wait, 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 sorry, there's somebody who is above everybody. So, the, so there's this pushback against religion. And by the way, uh, uh, that includes all of the music associated with those religions. So all of the Russian Orthodox church music, all of the Russian Jewish worship music, these become things that, that people no longer openly dare practice necessarily. That oh, This is not, not what the government says we can do. Talking about censorship. Two unions of musicians evolved at this time period in the 1920s. One was more traditional, the other more reactionary and ready to make sweeping new kinds of music. What were they hoping to do? They were anti-modernist. You're gonna have to see the video on the new objectivity, which is the next video in the series. They're against that next video. They're anti-Western. They say all that European, Western Europe, America stuff. We, we're, we're better than that. We, we, we got something going here. It's better. Anti-jazz, anti-old stuff, because they don't want to be, they don't want to remind people of the czarist, where the czar was the head of the state, and you had class structure, nobles, peasants, forget all that. If you say forget all that, then you say forget folk music, forget religious music, how do you tell a whole nation or several nations worth of people to forget their music? What do you do instead? You say, we will create new songs and new music for the people. So socialist realism was the controlling idea or doctrine of this for the arts. Every form of the arts served the goals of the state. Here were the goals. Um, this is in quotes, which translated because I cannot speak Russian. Truthful historic reflection of reality in revolution. Doesn't that sound like a city government motto that tries to get its own agenda done but doesn't want to outwardly offend anybody? I, I don't know, I don't, I, it bothers me. Maybe that's just, I don't know if it should bother me. Truthful historic reflection of reality in revolution. We don't want to fool ourselves into thinking that things aren't or are not, or that we, into things that aren't real. We want stuff that's practical, everyday, pragmatic, enough of this fairy tale stuff. Truthful, boy, there's a word. What does truthful mean? I mean, I know what it means, but what does it mean when it's thrown about in government? Historic reflection 
So yes, you can look on the back on the past, but only the right kind of past in revolution. Let's look ahead to the new stuff. See where this is going to be a better, cleaner, brighter. Now, if you think I'm being really creepy about the USSR and Russia, I would like to say, and I will say, that we will see this exact point of view in other places in Europe at this time and a little bit later in, in a couple lectures in Germany and in the US. So this is not just a flaw of the USSR. This, this is, uh, this gets thrown around the world. It's, it's not concentrated in one place necessarily. What does this mean? Music and art must be familiar and meaningful to all, not esoteric. <laughs> so music that requires you to read a lot, to think about it, to be a sort of thoughtful hmm, kind of person, uh-uh. You want music that gets a gut reaction, that somebody hears it and they say, oh, I'm crying. Or they hear it and they say, yes, I stand up right, I sing along right with you. It should be easy to sing. Oh, that instrumental music is not approved so much in this time period because the average person does not play the violin or the clarinet or the whatever. The average person, what can every human being do? They can sing. So we need to make music that is singable. We need to make music that is not just singable by trained singers, but we need to make music that is singable by the average guy who's out there digging a ditch, who's never sung before. If he can't sing it, forget it. And by the way, let's leave out all of the imagery uh, that refers to all this literature and stuff, philosophy, that the average person digging a ditch would not have encountered. We're taking it to the common denominator level, and if anything rises above that, look out. It's not supposed to. That leads to my next bullet point. The context, the content, excuse me, the content should easily be grasped. You must write obvious music. Don't write songs like Der Liermann, where you're left at the end going, oh, was that death playing the hurdy-gurdy? Are we dying? Or is that good? Is death good? Or is death bad? Am, am I? Is that me? Is that not me? You don't want to have the listener asking any questions. It should be obvious, like SpongeBob. Sorry, but SpongeBob is really obvious, is it not? I mean, here's a sponge. He's under the sea. He goes and does his spongy thing. There's the context. Dmitry Shostakovich, famous, important, significant composer, of which we are only going to look at just a fraction of his work. You could spend years looking at Dmitry Shostakovich. He lived 1906 to 1975. He was promoted by the Soviet government as a key figure of socialist Soviet realism. His first symphony was his final exam in music school. How's that for cool? Um, he met world renowned, he became world famous in 1926. In that symphony, the first symphony, are the seeds of what we will see is a sort of sarcastic, ironic humor. Here's a, here's a composer that is saying, yes, I will write for the socialist realism as he comes out of school, but we also see he's got his own personality. He's not just Xeroxing music and churning it out. We can actually see Shostakovich in his own music. One of the significant pieces that, alas, is not on your listening, but you could go listen to it, is Lady Macbeth of Metensk District from 1932. This is a um, retelling of the story of Macbeth. It is sort of the people's Macbeth. Lady Metensk, this is all ironic because these are all working class people. You think of Macbeth as a sort of highbrow drama, but what does it come down to? Ambitious people killing each other and getting nowhere. So he rewrites this into this opera, Lady Macbeth. We end up in this opera identifying with Katrina, the, the character Katrina, who happens to be a murderer, but she is the most human of all of the cast of characters in a rather inhuman bunch of people. It's like you're watching all of these terrible people on the stage and you think, well, the, the one I like is, is the murderer. That's, whoa, that should make us feel a bit weird. It's a little expressionist in a way. This opera, because of that sort of 
decadence of morals. Why, how could we possibly identify with a murderer? That's terrible. That opera did not impress Stalin. Um, and so Shostakovich was reproved in the, the state newspaper Pravda, a state-controlled newspaper, a newspaper that's what is published in the newspaper. If we say it's good, it's good. If we say it's bad, it's bad. If we say it's true in this newspaper, it's true. If we call it fake, it's fake. If you're thinking all newspapers are full of investigative journalism, it depends on who's pulling the strings. So, he's reproved in Pravda. Uh, this is what George Orwell writes about Big Brother is watching in Orwell's novel, 1984. Th this is the idea of this totalitarian always being watched. And Shostakovich expected to be arrested, and forever after his career in, in the USSR, he felt under threat. His Fifth Symphony is sort of like he says to the state, okay, I'll, I'll do it your way. Yeah, I've seen the light. I'm gonna fix my, I'm gonna fix my errors and you're gonna, I'm gonna write you a great piece. And the Fifth Symphony does the things that Soviet realism says that it must do. It's got, it's big, it's joyous, it goes from minor to major, it's, it ends with this really brilliant major sort of big brassy thing. It's really kind of sprawling as a matter of fact. Um, I feel like I've got some good notes in here that I wanted to say. Ah, here it is. Um, it, it, it's sort of, it's transfigured into the major key. Everything is just glorious and it's, it, it, it's like the big, the big dictator of the state. So, so he, so maybe he caved in and said, my own artistic ideas are not as important as the ideas of the state. Or did he? That's the question. And it's one of the questions that people can debate endlessly, I think. If it's so glorious and so great, the shoe really pinches, we might say, in the finale. That is, you get to the finale, and I think even in the third movement, and you start to think, is this so glorious? It, it's actually a little too glorious. I use this piece, the fourth movement, in my humanities class when we're talking about satire. Because as this sprawling finale unfolds and unfolds, there is too much going on. It's too major. We hear do, re, mi, fi so often. This major scale is made too major. Scale degree four is raised. The, the woodwind parts, especially in the finale, keep breaking in and, and over again, over again, over again, over again. There's too much motion. It's, it's got too much momentum. It's frantically trying to do all this. You said you wanted glorious music. Okay, here's glorious music, here's glorious music. It's too much, too much. Um, and even by the time we get to the glorious last few chords, and don't get me wrong, it is really fun to play that as a brass player. It's like, yeah, I'm going to just play really loud and it's okay finally I can play this glorious major cadence this diatonic D major chord but what happens while the brass are playing the major chord there's a repeated I know you want me to stop I want to stop too it's like stabbing this I think it's an A it stabs all the way through and it never stops until the end we keep waiting for five one and a sense of rest and instead we keep this it just keeps stabbing. Um, how do we take that ending? Modernism was perceived as being elitist. It expressed the artist's inner self. So symphony number five, then, if it is expressing the artist's inner self, it's a it's apparently a, dis a dissident work, not dissonant, but dissident, protesting. A work against something. But what? It's not overt. Shostakovich does not write down and say, this is what I'm against. He doesn't dare? Doesn't wish to? Hard to know. Perhaps against not modernism, but perhaps against totalitarianism, or perhaps against the fascist threats of the time.
communist, fascist, it's kind of actually hard to tell the difference when you're talking about these totalitarian differences. What are the style characteristics in this work? Here's one. Vigorous, folk-like motives and tunes that seem to link to Soviet socialist realism. We're writing music that seems to be of the people. It's not the old folk music, but it's folk-like. It makes us feel together in our Sovietness. Another style characteristic, elements of relentless totalitarianism. That is momentum. For example, I'm thinking the coda here, which keeps going over and over and over again. Ah, you're bombarded with coda. Not like Rossini's sort of champagne 5-1-5-1-5-1-5-1-5-1, but instead this is like, until you say you're done, we're going to keep codaing. <laughs> we're going to keep cadencing. Likewise, I think of the third movement, which you're not required to listen to, but there is this driving rhythmic force in the third movement that is equally relentless. The snare drum especially is... I, I feel freaked out every time I've ever played this. I get goosebumps because it's like, you're going to keep on going or we're going to do something terrible. This music could be contrasted with Aaron Copland's Fanfare for the Common Man. I'm going to let that comparison wait until the lecture on Worlds at War, um, if, which is two lectures from now.